Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you everyone for being here today. I'm so grateful to have you join us. My name is Vicki Townsend and I am the founder of the Cafe D and I developed this site for people that are thinking about it or they've gone through it or it might even been something that happened a long, long time ago and you're still trying to get your footing. You're still trying to grow and trying to learn the lessons from it. And it's because of that that I'm bringing to you something that's so important that I wish I had had so many years ago. Um, it's a very emotional topic for me because I've already seen these slides and I went through them and um, I, I wish I had seen them before. But it's the three essential ingredients to save a dying marriage. And why is this important if you've already been through it? It's really important for you to know what to look out for in your next relationship or the relationship that you're in now, how to, how to save it. And that's why I want to bring my friend, Dr. Jeff Kane on with us today. Jeff has been happily married to his lovely wife and my very dear friend, Sherry Kane, for over 20 years. They have two wonderful teenage boys, Jordan and Jeremy. Great kids, just worked with them this weekend. He's an author, he's a speaker, and he's a doctor in marriage and family therapy. He's spoken at conferences and talk radio stations throughout the United States, and he shares his passion for helping couples have a more fulfilling relationship. He's got a private practice, and he's been in private practice for over 20 years, and he's the CEO of Family Therapy Center with two locations in South Florida. Um, he's the founder of Relationships Unscripted. It's on Facebook. It's a community and a playground for couples to hang out and grow their relationships. He's dedicated to helping couples regain their passion, which is why he's here with us today. Passion, fire, and to help couples have incredible intimacy in their relationships. He's the author of four books, and his later, latest book is The 12 Best Kept Secrets to a Fulfilling Relationship. You know, it's filled with great advice for couples to recharge and revitalize their relationships. So the reason that I have Jeff on here is hopefully Jeff's mission, Jeff is on a mission to save marriages. He's not here to help you get divorced. So the reason that I brought him on is so that we can see if you're in a relationship that is, you know, maybe dying, what you need to do to turn that around. And if you're about to step into, or if you're in a relationship with somebody to how to save that and make sure that that doesn't die either. So with that, I would like to welcome my very dear friend, Dr. Jeff Kane. Hi, Jeff. Hi there, Vicki. Great to be here. Oh, it's so great to have you here. And this, this one's an emotional topic. It's really, um, and it's important too, because people need to understand what it is that, that, that they need to do the next time in the next relationship, right? So true. Uh, you know, we all reach points and times in our lives and our relationships where we go through challenges and we, we reach points where we are at a crossroads, where we're trying to figure out if a relationship can be saved and if there is still hope there or we need to move forward. Agreed. Agreed. So Jeff, you've developed this amazing, amazing PowerPoint for us. And this slide will take us through all of the things that we need. So on that note, I'm going to let you take this away. Perfect. Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here, Vicki. Uh, I think it's amazing what you're doing with Cafe D and, and reaching out to, to people all around the world, trying to help them address some of the challenges that they're experiencing, whether it's trying to stay together or begin to move in a different direction. I think it's great work that you're doing. I'm really excited about sharing with you something that I'm passionate about, and that is helping couples find a way to address issues in their relationship and begin to move in a better direction. So one of the things I first wanted to start off with, because uh, I know from my conversations with Vicki that many of you who are listening in are, are all in different places in terms of where you are in your lives and where you are in terms of being in a relationship or no longer in a relationship. So I want to start off by first having you ask yourself, you know, why are you here today? You know, I want you to think about what, what brings you here as part of this conversation that we're having. Is it, part of it that your relationship is breaking down and maybe it's hanging by a string? Um, maybe you're at a crossroads, um, you know, a fork in the road. A lot of times in life we, we reach places where we are just trying to find answers and, and not quite sure of, of how to find them. And it can be a challenge, you know, when you're in a place and you know things aren't working well and you know you have an investment. Uh, many of the couples I work with 
I've been together for 10, 15, 20 years or more. And life is precious, relationships are precious, and, and being able to try to find answers can be such a challenge, uh, especially when you feel like you've tried everything. I often hear couples say that they've tried everything they can possibly do to resolve issues in their relationship, and they feel like they've run out of solutions. Um, so that might be you. You know, you might be at that crossroads where you feel like there, there is no, no more solutions to, to find. Um, and I can tell you that as, as many solutions that you try to find, there's always more to find. And a lot of times it's just we have a, a set of solutions that we're familiar with and we haven't really had a chance to look outside those beliefs that we're carrying. Um, and, may, and for many of you, it might be that you're losing hope. You know, after being in a relationship for a period of time, it's, it's so easy to begin to lose hope and, and wonder, can this relationship be different? Uh, the struggles and the challenges of trying to connect and just feeling so distant um, from your loved one. This is a person, if you go back and think about that you fell in love with, right? The person that things were amazing with at a certain point in time and then all of a sudden things started to change and, and sometimes when things change we know they're changing but we don't always know what to do about it or, or how things could begin to be different in your relationship. So we're going to look at that a little bit today. Is if you are in a place where you're at a crossroads or losing hope, you know, or breaking down, like just breaking down, what can you do to begin to move forward? Um, and for some of you, it might be the feeling of being numb in a relationship. Um, and using numbness really comes from having a long period of time where some of the really important issues haven't been addressed, and, and maybe you've tried so many different things to try to connect, and and as much as you've tried to connect, in the end, you felt very disconnected. Um, so the feeling of being numb is really just your kind of mind and your body's way of, of kind of keeping you safe so that you don't feel the pain of what you're going through. And we're going to look at that a little bit today too, is how do you manage things when you're feeling numb and, and what do you do as you begin to try to move forward? So can your marriage be saved? Um, I, I hear this question uh, all the time when I speak with couples over the phone before I meet with them or when I work with them uh, on Skype all around the world is can can our marriage be saved? You know, can things be different in our relationship? Um, and the challenge is often for many couples is the investment in the relationship. And we're going to talk about that today. Is what is your investment in your relationship? Uh, and also how motivated are you for things to be different? Uh, the first ingredient that we're going to look at today is for me one of the most essential ingredients to any relationship. And without it, there is no relationship, and that is love. Uh, we all love it. We all need it. We all want it. We want it on an individual basis. We want it in our relationship. And we need to really <clears throat> begin to move forward and, and begin to have hope moving forward. So I'd like to break down love in, in four separate kind of categories, which are, which are really essential to having a strong relationship. And the first one is like. I want you to ask yourself, do you like? the person you're in a relationship with. You know, and a lot of times when I when I work with couples and I ask them this, they kind of look at me and, and kind of smile and they realize, uh, you know, do we even like each other anymore? Um, how do you love somebody if you don't first like them? The other piece is, is being open-minded. Um, a lot of times when you've been in a relationship where you've experienced so many ups and downs, you begin to lose sense of perspective. Uh, you begin to lose a sense of investment. You begin to lose a sense of can things really be different in your relationship and, and you begin to get closed-minded. So even opportunities that you might see for things to turn around, you might ignore those things. Um, one of the things I often share with couples is when things are going good in the relationship, you're ignoring a whole bunch of stuff that would make things go in the wrong direction. And when things are going bad in a relationship, you're paying attention to all the things that make you want to run away and begin to make you feel like there's no longer any hope moving forward. So part of it is being open-minded and ask yourself, you know, can you be open-minded in your relationship? And if you're not, how can things change if you're not going to be open-minded in your relationship? So the conversations that a lot of times couples have when we begin to look at them and begin to break them down, a lot of the conversations stay stuck because you already feel like you have the answer, right? In your mind, you already feel like you know how things are going to unfold. I'm sure many of you can probably almost play it back in your mind how things are going to unfold in your mind based on prior conversations. 
and that gets that gets kind of old, right? Because how many times can you hear the same conversation and and feeling that same dead end road and and realizing, wow, where are we going with this? Why are we even going to have this conversation? So that sometimes that's what leads people to to begin to get closed minded is just the the feeling that things can be different or that they won't be different. So a big part of really beginning to reignite that love and that passion is beginning to become open-minded to your relationship and that sometimes requires that you begin to look beyond where you're standing. Sometimes uh, where you're standing is not where you want to stand. Um, but I want you to think a little bit about where would you like things to be in your relationship moving forward? How would you like things to be different? And then how does that inform how you behave in the present? Right? So instead of, instead of kind of focusing in on where you are now, Think about where you want to be. It's like if you go to the gym and you, you look around and you maybe see some people and you think to yourself, wow, I'd really like to you know, have a body like that. I'd really like to get in shape so I can feel healthy and look healthy. Um, so if you, if you focus too much on the mirror where you are, you might get a little bit disappointed, right? You might, might get frustrated. You might want to even leave the gym. But if you begin to, to look at where you want to be and where you're heading, that, that can be great motivation to really begin to get in there and really do the work you need to do to get to a better place. The other important component of, of love is, is being able to be vulnerable. And this is the, probably one of the most challenging parts for couples when they want to begin to get connected again is being interested in being vulnerable again. Because you know many times you've tried to be vulnerable in your relationship and maybe you haven't received the response that you hoped for. The person maybe has used your vulnerability in a way that has created problems or arguments or used your vulnerabilities in a way that has made things escalate in the relationship. Or maybe you feel like you've been exposed based on those vulnerabilities, right? And the person just doesn't have compassion around those vulnerabilities. We all have vulnerabilities. Um, and one of the most challenging things is beginning to find a way to be vulnerable again in your relationship. And the couples that, I, that we work with, um, both locally and around the world, um, when we hear them, that first meeting, the first thing that, that is very, very obvious is that they're scared of being vulnerable again. And, and I always tell them, how can you create change if you're not willing to be vulnerable? There's really no way to create change. If you want to create change in your relationship, one of the most important things to do is to be vulnerable. And being vulnerable is difficult when you've been through a lot because you're you're scared, you're concerned that if you do start to be open with the person you're with, they might let you down, or that they may not be vulnerable in return. So there's a lot of pain and a lot of hurt that goes into that. And it's 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 really beyond the scope of what we'll get into today. But part of it is being willing to be vulnerable again in your relationship because that really opens up pathways for you and your loved ones to connect on a, in a very deep way. The last component of love is, is empathy, and I, I can't really even emphasize it enough how important it is to have empathy in your relationship. And it could be as simple as just sitting down and listening to your loved one and really trying to connect with where they are. You know, I, I know a lot of us as, as men, we're fixer-uppers, right? So you, you hear your wife share something that, that she's frustrated with or irritated by, and the first thing that we often want to do is swoop in and, and begin to find solutions. You know, begin to go in there and, and help your wife move from where she is to where you think she should go. But one of the things I want you to think about is, are you really moving the person in the direction that they want to go or in the direction that you think they should go? And that's, that's a big difference. That's a very big difference. But empathy could be simply just sitting there and listening and really being there in the moment. And when I say be there in the moment, I, I mean it. I mean it completely and totally. Being there in the moment, really trying to understand where your loved one is. If your husband is not with you totally in that moment, how does that make you feel? If you're sitting there and talking with your wife, and you feel like she's more interested in Facebook or more interested in something happening on the TV than your conversation it's hard to feel that that person has empathy for you. And that creates disconnection. And inevitably affects your love, right? It affects your connection. It affects your closeness. It affects the ability for you and your loved one to connect on a very deep level. 
so empathy runs it, it runs throughout the relationship and a lot of times I, I use the example those of you who have children um, this will make a lot of sense to you is when you show empathy to your child it's just natural you don't even have to try your loved one comes home your your son or your daughter comes home and they had a rough day at school it's not very difficult to sit there and listen and really try to understand well what 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 wrong with your day what what happened how can I be here for you right or they scrape their knee right the empathy is just natural you want to show love you want to be there you want to support your child and on an adult level that love and that support is no different it has to come from a very deep place and having empathy is very difficult when you start to lose love in your relationship so part of it is beginning to look at that right and a lot of times I, I have couples ask me, how do I get the love back? You know, how do I begin to love again? And, and that's probably one of the most difficult things to begin to recapture in a relationship because you can't manufacture love, right? No one tells you to love someone. It just happens, right? But I can tell you this. If you begin to change behavior, your love will begin to change. And your emotions know what to do. When, when you start to notice behavior and experience behavior that makes you feel more connected. So that's a big, big, big piece of it. It's beginning to show empathy in your relationship and beginning to connect on a very deep level. Jeff, can I ask you a so, couple of questions? Because yeah. this slide was just amazing. Um, and sure. the first one about liking the person that you're with. I think that, you know, when you've gone through so much and and the, I have questions about the being vulnerable too but when you don't necessarily like somebody because they've had some really you know awful behaviors that you see that you know you're not so you know you're they're just not acceptable to you and you sit there and you realize you know I'm not sure that I like this person is there a way to get that back Getting the liking back? Is yeah, that can you like them? I, I, you said that that was like the first question is, do I like this person? If you like this person, that's a you know obviously a, a key ingredient. But if you you know you don't like them for some awful behaviors and some history that you've got with them that you, you that you've had that's been uncomfortable, can you compartmentalize? I'm not I'm not even sure what I'm really trying to drive at. But how do you get the like back? Forget the love. How do you get the like back? Well, I, you know, I think that's a great question. Um, really getting the light back really has to do with addressing the underlying issues that are affecting your ability to connect with your loved one. So it's not it's not really compartmentalizing at all because when you kind of compartmentalize what you do, if you try to ignore something, that's still having an influence on you. So really beginning to like someone really begins to diving into addressing the concerns that are getting in the way of you liking a person. Just like if you had a friend that you liked a lot and then something happened or many things happened that made you feel differently about that person. You, you know, you sit down maybe and have lunch with that person, you begin to really address and work through what exactly happened and how did it affect you and how did it begin to change the way you felt about the other person and the connection that you once had. So it really has to do with some real deeper stuff and really begin to address the depth of what's happened in your relationship and how it's pulled you apart because that's that's what affects your ability to like the person you're in a relationship with. Gotcha, gotcha. And the second one <clears throat> that stood out to me because I'm over here taking notes like crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, the second thing that stood out to me was being vulnerable because when you become vulnerable, and I guess this would be, you know, in the context of trying to save your marriage, um, but if you've, but it's also a key ingredient for an ongoing marriage that's wonderful, right? And for so for future relationships, so vulnerability is a very important part of both of those sides of the coin. But when you've been vulnerable, and you say, okay, I will be vulnerable again, would you say if if that person um, again, uh, what's the word? You know stomps on your vulnerability or betrays that vulnerability is that the is that the life lesson that you learn to say okay this is not a salvageable relationship because that person has once again taken advantage of my vulnerability and hurt me is that 
what would you would you use that in well, that context? I, um, it's so it's so um, it's different for everyone, right? So when we talk about vulnerability, um, everyone has a tolerance, a different level of tolerance for how much they can manage um, in terms of you know person crossing that line of vulnerability before they've had enough. So for some people, um, I've had couples where you know when that line is crossed once, in, in, in many cases, uh, you know that's all it takes. You know we've crossed that line once, and I'm not sure if I can ever be that close to you again. Um, and some people are more resilient, um, where they that line is crossed many times, and they still find a way to bounce back. So that's that's really something to look really deep inside yourself of, of how how much interest do you have and how much hope do you have um, to begin to begin to work through that again. Because that takes a lot of energy, right? Because once you've been hurt, you know, part of you is thinking, is it even worth being open again? Because I'm going to put myself in the same position I was before. Um, but I, I always kind of use the example of um, if you if you threw somebody the keys to your car because they need to borrow your car, and they came back, you know, a few hours later, and you know, your car has dents in it, and you know, there's paint missing, and the car is just a complete wreck, and they hand you the keys back, and they say, well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to harm your car, I didn't mean to put all the dents in your car, and you, you know, you go and you fix your car, and you, you get it repainted again, and, and you get rid of the dents, and three months later, the person comes up to you and gets the, can I borrow the car again, right? And the person you're going to think is, I, I have to be crazy to let the person borrow the car. Um, but the truth is, if you want to ever be able to trust that person again, you would have to be able to take that risk of possibly giving the person your car again, and coming back in bad shape, and the same thing with a relationship is there is a risk involved with doing it, but you'll never see what the possibilities are, and if things can be different unless you are willing to take that risk, and, that, and that's a personal choice. Yeah, that made that that makes a lot of sense. One of the things that you said at the beginning of this, Jeff, was absolutely. I mean, it, I felt like you had a target on me, and that you were directing this conversation to me, and that was about numbness, and that that is our our body and our, our, our mind's ability to pr protect itself. So I think what happens to a lot of us is when we've had our vulnerabilities exposed and violated, that we become numb. And um, it's a, yeah, I, I'm actually really anxious to learn how we overcome that numbness because so many people that I talk to that are either trying to save their marriage or they've, they're post-divorce, they're numb. So I'm really anxious to, to see because I think that a lot of that numbness, Jeff, at least from my perspective, comes from being vulnerable and having that vulnerability violated. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely no doubt about it. Um, and there's no one cure to numbness. It, it's really a lot of different things that have to come together in order to begin to move in a better direction because the numbness, you know, when you're having the numbness, you're not really feeling the pain as deeply as you did before. And it's kind of like your body's way of kind of keeping you safe. So you don't have to feel vulnerable again. You don't have to feel empathy again. You don't have to be so open-minded again. You don't have to worry about liking the person, right? So all these things that we're talking about here, you don't have to worry about those things because now you, you're you numb, which means you've withdrawn from the relationship. Right, right. On right. some level. And so your motivation then to change it then is that's where things begin to go away because your motivation begins to change. Um, so that kind of like kind of leads me to this area here, which really is that if if both people really think about each other's needs, the relationship will be nourished. And that's that's one of the main things that begin to break down in a relationship when, when things aren't going good is we really begin to forget about the other person's needs and we begin to just look at our own. And, and a lot of times it's for self preservation. Right, because you are just exhausted, right? You put so much into it. It's like I don't know, working out for six months and you look in the mirror and say, Well, why do I even bother working out for six months? I, I seem to look the same as I did six months ago. Um, so in a relationship you wanna you wanna feel that when you're doing things to change things that it's making a difference. Um, but I can tell you a lot of times people work really hard in the relationship but they're just working in the wrong direction. They're not even really clear on what the needs are of the other person or what the other person is perceiving from the lens that they're looking through. Um, when I meet with couples for the first meeting, the, the couple is very clear, both of them are, on what's going wrong on an individual level. But then when I ask them to share a little bit about what they feel or think the other person is feeling or thinking, um, when they try to guess that, the other person looks at them like they have three heads because they're completely off base. 
um, you're just not feeling each other, you're not connected because you're not used to serving each other. You know, you you tried to maybe do that before and been unsuccessful, so then you just worry about serving yourself. And at that point, you're you're kind of in a relationship, but you're not really in the relationship anymore because you're not really invested in the relationship. Gotcha. Was there another question that you had too? Um, no, I'm good. I I I'm I, I want you to move on. Oh. I don't. I, I I'm gonna pop in with some questions as they come up. But so far, so yeah. good. This is great Perfect. information, Jeff. Thank you. Perfect. My pleasure. So I want you to ask yourself, is your love on life support? Um, so here are some of the things to look at to begin to explore if this is the case. Um, small things become big, right? So it's the old kind of example of the toilet paper in which way it comes out of school, right? Or the toothpaste cap, right? Or one of the ones that I love, I love to kind of use is, uh, and I think this is a good example of, of two different points in time and how things can change. Um, I worked with a couple a long time ago. And um, for some of the men out there who use uh, shavers or disposable shavers, you'll you'll connect with this. Um, when you when you shave your your face, a lot of times um, when you clean off the shaver, you might leave those little kind of hairs in the sink. And um, if you don't clean them out, those little hairs kind of over time can you know become bigger hairs, right? They begin to take over the whole sink. So I was working with a couple of years ago, and um, the woman, uh, this gentleman's uh, wife, was sharing that. You know, he left these hairs in the sink, and he he was intentionally leaving these little hairs in the sink because he was trying to drive her crazy by leaving these hairs in the sink. And uh, he looked at me and he looked at her like shaking his head, like I don't understand that. And I asked her, I said, well, let me ask you something. When they were married about 15 years at the time, when when you were first married, and he did he ever leave hairs in the sink? You know, early on, did he ever shave and leave these little hairs in the sink? And then she looked at me. Afterwards, and she smiled, and she goes, you know what? He did leave those hairs in the sink. Even at the beginning, I remember him leaving those hairs in the sink. And I said, was he leaving the same hairs in the sink 15 years ago as he's leaving in the sink now? And she goes, yep, the same hairs. And I said, what's different? And she goes, I see the hairs differently. I perceive the hairs differently. Right? So the same hairs that were in that sink 15 years ago are perceived completely different when things aren't going good. Now those hairs... Are intentional, right? They're made. They're made to be there to make her life difficult. So that's a that's a really a great example. I think of how often these smaller things that we begin to look through, like that magnifying glass, becomes so big because we're looking for the person to do things to get us upset or to get us angry. So you really are living under a microscope. You notice way more of what the person's doing that's upsetting you and frustrating you than the things that the person may be doing. To, to lift you up or to say positive things, so that's that's really a big piece, and and really that's what happens when your life when your relationship is on life support, is you begin to really on a deep level put everything under a microscope, and then then you can ask yourself why can't you find change then right? Well, how can you find change if, if everything you're looking for is for things to go wrong? Um, and the other the other part is you begin to live in a way which you're walking on eggshells, right? So. So what kind of eggshells, um, to simply kind of state it, is that you're very careful in what you say and how you say it. Um, you're always navigating the territory. You're always careful, you know, about should I say it now or should I not say it? Is it worth saying, right? Or if I say this, we're going to have a bad night or we're going to argue all night. So you're very careful, often very strategic in what you say and how you say it. In fact, you might even feel like you're an actor or an actress in your relationship because you can't completely be yourself. You have to put on a facade or a certain image in order to connect with your loved one. If you don't, what ends up happening is you end up having these explosive disagreements because you can't be yourself. So those, those are all examples of things being on life support in your relationship. So one of the things that happens is avoidance begins to, as you begin to avoid these issues, as you walk on these eggshells, is you begin to create more distance in your relationship. Right? And you can feel it. You can feel when you have more distance. So here's some here's some ways of knowing if you have distance. And some of you, I think, will really connect with this. You start to find yourself taking the long way home from work. Right. So the last thing you want to do is get home because you just know when you get home, it's not going to be pretty. So you take the long way home, or, or you stop off somewhere before you go home because you're dread you're, you're completely dreading the idea of being home. The other thing that you do. Um, if, if you work or even if you're not working, you find time to be out of the home. 
right? You find excuses to be away from the home, getting together with friends, um, with girlfriends, with colleagues, finding work appointments or business appointments just so that you don't have to be home. And you can get really good at doing that, um, probably too good. And what you're doing there, obviously, is you're just avoiding the uncomfortableness, right? And that, that obviously makes things worse over time because then at some point you're not even really in a marriage anymore. You're, you're pretty much two single people who happen to share a home together, who happen to share a space together. The other thing is that um, you begin to dread spending time with one another because you just know it's not going to be fun. Right? You're not connected. You're not enjoying each other's company. And you're just dreading that time that you may have to spend together because you're just not going to be able to relax and, and just be able to enjoy the time that you spend. And that's another sign that you're starting to move further and further apart in your relationship. Jeff, can I ask you a question? So one of the things I like to tell couples is really if you, yes. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Could you just go back to that one slide? Because you said something that I think that um, I have heard over and over and over again, and that's that your spouse is more like your roommate. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I've heard of a, you know, the most dangerous relationship is that brother sister relationship where you're not connected on that marriage partnership level, but you're just kind of existing. How dangerous is that? Well, um, it's, it's, it's dangerous in the sense of that it kind of goes back to the numb thing, you know, feeling numb, you know, part is when you, when you start to function no longer like husband and wife, uh, what happens is you just start cohabitating, right? You no longer have the ingredients of the intimacy, the love, the closeness that you need in order to grow your relationship. So you are functioning like roommates on, on that level. And over time, the more you do that, you'll, you'll see more resentfulness, more frustration. You'll see more anger, um, more sarcasm. Um, a lot of things begin to come out because you're just frustrated of trying to make something you know work that may not be working, and and you may not just have the solutions to how to make things different. This is amazing stuff, Jeff. Like I haven't taken this many notes on a webinar that I've done than I have, and we're mm -hmm. only a few slides in. So this is great. Thank you. Great, my pleasure. So if you want to save your relationship, it's critically important that you share your feelings. For you to reconnect and feel those emotions, you have to be open and be vulnerable. And there's really no other way about it. That's really the only way to begin to create shifts. And if you're not sure how to do that together, I would encourage you to find a person, an expert, who works with couples to help you do that. So then the next piece I want you to think about is, could you unintentionally make your relationship work without even knowing it? Could you be unintentionally making your relationship worse without even knowing it? You know, I work, I see it so often with couples where they're actually making things head down a road that's going to make things worse and they don't realize they're even doing it. And where it starts really is the comments that you make and the questions that you ask. Right? So a lot of times when you're in a relationship with somebody, you may be trying to, in your marriage, you might be trying to really hard find a way to get closer or to connect. But sometimes it's not the content of what you're saying, it's the way that you're going about saying it. And it also has to do with the way the person's hearing you. So imagine this, being in a relationship for so many years and you're not realizing it, but what you're doing and the way you're approaching the person you're with unintentionally is making things work. But then the other person is not telling you that what you're doing is making things work. They just think you're intentionally trying to mess with the relationship and make it work because you don't like the person anymore or that you don't love the person anymore or you don't care about the person anymore. But what you're doing is completely unintentional because maybe you're frustrated or you're irritated or you're uncomfortable and you're not even sure how to even approach the person you're with anymore. And that's how complicated relationships can be over time is you begin to not even know how to approach the other person. And the things that you're doing, which are unintentionally making things worse, 
you're going to keep on doing because you don't know that what you're doing is actually making things work. How can you change something if you don't if you're not even aware that it exists? If you if you don't know it exists, you are not going to change it. <clears throat> I love this picture. Um, <laughs> so I want you to ask yourself, really, what is your choice? What is your choice? Do you want to have compassion in your relationship, or do you want to lecture each other? Right? How many of you ever felt like this, male or female, either way? Right? How many of you ever felt like you were being lectured in your relationship? Right? The person was telling you about all the things that you need to change and all the things that you're doing wrong. And if you just did those things, everything would be perfect. Right? And that's really, I can tell you, I work a lot of times with couples who've been to other therapy. And here's what a lot of times um, couples do when they go to therapy is <clears throat> they both tell the therapist what the other person needs to change. And then the therapist says, okay, great, you know, Larry, you, you want Mary to do this, so Mary, you do this. And they work on Mary changing these things um, over a period of several meetings. And then Mary says, well, I want Larry to do this differently. And, and then the therapist says, okay, great, Larry, you need to begin to do this differently. And then they, they you know, a few months, and they feel like the therapy was a success. And then things go good for a little bit, and then here's what happens. Three months later, six months later, a year later, things begin to go right back to where they were before. Because the truth is, is that's not really the deep cleaning that needs to happen with couples. Now, I always tell couples I work with that there's only one way to play, and that's really all out. And if we don't really address the underlying issues, Nothing is going to change. You can you can sit down and tell the other person what you want to be different, and the person can do exactly those things. But does it really change the relationship? You know, ask yourself how many times in your relationship has the other person done what you've asked just to make you happy, but the person only does it for a little while, but then eventually they're going to go right back to the old behavior because you're not feeling connected. You're not really doing the change. You're not really engaging in the change for the right reason. And that's where compassion comes, right? When you have compassion, what you're doing because you're feeling so connected makes sense. It has to make sense on an individual level before it will make sense on a relationship level. Those two things are, are very much connected. So the depth of your love will definitely be defined by how you act, right? It's, it's the behavior. How do you act day to day? How do you treat the other person? How do you show love? How do you show distance? When you come in the door, it starts when you come in that door after a long day, how do you approach the other person? Are you happy to see the person? Right? Do you do you look at the other person like you you just seen a ghost, right? You're not very excited to be there. You can feel that, right? You can sense that right when you walk in the door. So it has to do with your behavior. Your behavior will define your relationship. So now we're going to move on to ingredient number two, and that's your investment in your marriage. And I want you to ask yourself, what is your investment in your relationship? You know, in this day and age, um, we live in a disposable society, right? So a lot of times what I've noticed is the investment in relationships is not what it used to be. And I can tell you that in long-term relationships, the couple is invested 100%. Now, you may experience up and downs. You may get frustrated. You may get irritated. You might feel distant sometimes. But the investment is always there. And when I work with couples, that's one of the first things I ask them. Whether they're sitting locally in my office or I'm doing it with Skype with a couple in Australia, I ask them, what is your investment in your relationship? Because I, because without that investment, I cannot help a couple get to a better place. And move to a better place is they have to be fully invested in the relationship. Now, you may not know how to get from where you are to where you want to go, and that's perfectly fine. You might feel very angry and frustrated and very distant and even feel numb, but are you still invested in your relationship? Because you can't create change without an investment, and that's in your relationship with your spouse or in your business or in your life. Without an investment, you will never be able to create change. Jeff, I have a question about that because you've, you've struck on another, another chord with me and that is it seems that people, it, and I don't know if it's just a perception or if it's reality, that 
yes, I feel like people feel that marriages are disposable these days. That's just, you know, and, and maybe it's because of the universe that you and I live in. Um, but it, it definitely appears as though it's a throwaway. It's not that big a deal. Marriages, um, you know, they, if I don't like it, I just can move on. It's not a big deal. How do you create that investment? What is what does that mean creating an investment? How do you get how how was that investment measured? Well, we're going to we're going to explore that moving forward. The you know, investment is something that you have to feel that's not necessarily measurable. So, a lot of times your investment may change because you're not getting what you need from your relationship. It's not it's not being fulfilling for you, right? So, you're not feeling fulfilled in your relationship, you may begin to question your investment. It's kind of like if you went down to, um, if you were a gambler, right? You went down to the local casino and you're you're sitting there and you're you know an hour into it, two hours into it, and maybe you're losing a lot of money. You have a choice to make at some point, right? You either stay at the table and go all in, right, which means you could lose more, or you sit at the table and say, I'm gonna, you know. I'm going to see what happens here. I really feel like things can be different. I'm not sure what's going to happen next, but I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. Right? I'm going to really see if things can be different. Or you leave the table, right, and say, I don't want to put any more money here and create any more risk. Um, the only way you know, to begin to move in a, into a better place in your relationship is really be willing to create a, a full-out investment in your relationship, even if you're skeptical, even if you're concerned if it can actually be different. Because the concern about things being different or the hesitancy around it is what gets into the very fabric of the relationship and influences your ability to connect. You can feel when the person you're with is not invested in the relationship. You can right. Feel it. Yeah. You can gotcha. See it. You can yeah, it is. It's, it's very palpable, isn't it? Even though you, yeah. it's not something you can see. It's something that you can feel most definitely. Yeah. For sure. So it comes back to the long haul, right? Are you are you in this for the long haul? And um, you know, really, how do you know if you're in it for the long haul? Um, one one thing to begin to ask yourself, those of you who are kind of questioning this on on the webinar today, is you have all your cards on the table, right? And, and maybe you just have some of your cards on the table. And I, I can tell you, to me, that's a good start. Like if you still have an investment and and you've taken some cards off the table, but you still have some on, then you're still in the game, right? If you're taking all your cards on the table, but you want change, then you're fooling yourself. You cannot create change if you have no cards left on the table. Just like in the gambling example, right? You take your cards off the table, you're done, right? And sometimes that's okay, right? Like sometimes it's okay and say, I'm not going to hang out and do this anymore. But if you want to see change or the possibility of things change, changing, you, you would need to put some cards on that table. The other thing is, um, is to ask yourself, are you staying for the right or the wrong reasons, right? So a typical one is, you know, we have children together, right? So we need to save this marriage because we have children together. Um, I've worked with so many couples who grew up in homes where their parents were married, but they hated each other. They didn't like each other at all, and there was very little or any love in the relationship. And I asked them, I'd asked them so many times, would you have preferred that your parents stay together and fight and be miserable or pretend everything's okay, right? Or would you rather them to live in two separate homes? And had two happy parents, two single parents, but very happy parents that you can enjoy their company with. And, and 90 something percent of the time, the person says, No, I wish they, they ended the relationship because the children suffer. They can feel it when things aren't going good. They can feel when there's not that connection. They can feel the underlying tension. And that begins to affect the very roots of who they are. So sometimes what you're trying to, to save or what you're trying to stay in, even if you feel like it's for the right reasons, over time, it may influence your children and have a negative effect on them moving forward. Oh my gosh, Jeff, that's huge what you just said. And I agree, I happen to agree with it too. Staying in a relationship where children do not see what true love and connection is, teaching them, teaches them and that that's what a marriage is. And that's, uh, that's not healthy either. Yes. Yes, that's big. That's really a big one. Um, it's, it's so big. Um, and the other one is really um, how deep or how shallow is your connection, right? Because if if you're just going through the motion, you have a shallow connection, how would you expect to create change in your relationship? Um, your 
your ability to move forward or to create change is very much connected to your investment and how you feel about the person you're in a relationship with. So you can be very upset with somebody or very angry but still have a lot of love there, right? You just may not sure of how to feel the love that you once had or feel the connection that you once had, right? But if you if you have a deep connection there and you still have that love, that's one of the most important ingredients to try to move your relationship from where it is now to a better place. So part of the, the, the question I often get when I work with couples is, is then kind of it's more of a, a kind of indirect question is should I increase my investment in this relationship? Is it worth, you know, is it worth saving? You know, is it worth trying to play all out and see if things can be different? And that's that's really uh, what a personal choice that is, right? Because at the end of the day, when you move forward years down the road, you really want to make sure that you thoroughly thought through your decision and it was a good decision at that time, right? And if you really made an investment there and you want to make sure that you, you figure out whatever you need to, whether it's to stay in and work it out or to move forward, you want to feel like you put everything into that. Um, but in order for that to happen, you have to ask yourself, are you open to finding new solutions? A lot of times I hear couples say that they want solutions, but what happens is when we get into like the real meat of it and the real core of it and they really have to work on stuff, the behavior always will show the reality of where that person is. The person who really wants to save the relationship and really has an investment, their behavior will show their spouse that they want the relationship. They'll begin to shift things and begin to change things, which can be uncomfortable to do, but I can tell you that there's no change I've ever seen with couples that's worthwhile that doesn't require some uncomfortableness. There's no change in your life that doesn't require that you become uncomfortable. So that's part of what I see as, as what this experience would be like for any couple who wants to change things is being willing to be uncomfortable and also being willing to play all out and all in. Because if you're not willing to do that, your relationship will never go from where it is today or where it may be today to where you want it to go. So you have to ask yourself, are you really open to finding new solutions? So let's let's say your investment isn't exactly where you want it to be right now. And I want you to begin to think about and, and ask yourself, what steps do you need to take right, to begin to address what is being ignored in your relationship? Why is a problem being ignored? There's, there's reason or reasons often why problems are ignored in a relationship. Um, and a lot of times, one of, the, one of the main reasons why things are being ignored in a relationship is because you've had a lack of success when you've tried to address the problem together, finding solutions. So you begin to become disappointed. You, it begins to affect your motivation to find change in your relationship. So the, one of the first steps of really beginning to, to work on the issue of your investment, begin to alter it, begin to make space in your relationship to talk about what's been ignored. What, one of the biggest things that affects a couple's ability to stay connected is, is begin to talk about what often has been ignored before in the past. What, what's not spoken about often plays a much bigger role than the actual words that you use. So being able to create space in your relationship to talk about what's being ignored can completely shift the relationship and completely shift your investment. The other part is what's the game plan, right? A lot of times I sit down with couples and I ask them, well, how would you like things to be in a relationship moving forward in the next you know, year or the next five years or the next ten years? And a lot of times the couple has a completely different game plan. So ask yourself this, how can you be in a marriage and expect success if you have a completely different game plan? Those of you who watch sports, you know, one of the, ways, one of the best ways to tell a team that's, that's very successful from a team that's not is go look at how they're game planning it, right? What are they doing? You know, in a team that's not working well, once once the score starts to go in a bad direction, you can just see them giving up. Uh, they don't have hope. Whereas a team that is doing really well and very successful and has a winning record, when, when the chips are down, it's just motivation to try to figure stuff out. They actually get inspired, right, when the chips are down because they, they, they pull them more together and get closer and figure out how they're going to get from where they are to where they want to go. The other piece is all the steps the change that you're creating, is it a fit for both of you, right? Because a lot of times in your mind's eye, you have an idea of what change should look like, and you assume that that's the same change that your loved one wants. But are you checking that with the other person? Because usually here's the way it works. 
is you have your idea of what change should look like, and your significant other has their idea of what change looks like. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good change for your relationship. So that's something most often that you have to create together. It's not one thing that you can create for your relationship or the other person can create for you. Ignoring the problems in your relationship will give you the illusion that they no longer exist. I want you to think pretty, pretty deeply about this, and I'm going to say it one more time. Ignoring the problems in your relationship will give you the illusion that they no longer exist. How many times have you become so good at ignoring problems in your relationship and telling yourself the story that the problems are no longer there because you don't want them to exist, right? You create that illusion to what you're saying. It's too painful. But that's an illusion. It's not reality. And I believe in living in reality, right? If we're not looking at what's really going on, we're just fooling ourselves. Wow, Jeff, this is huge. Huge, huge, huge. So often couples do not create space in the relationship so they can be their raw, raw self. Listen to your voice and share it with your loved one. Are you being raw in your relationship? And I don't mean raw in a, in a disrespectful, rude way. I mean raw in terms of your authentic self in your relationship. Are you being you in your relationship? If you're sitting down today and you're looking in the mirror and you ask, you're, you're asking yourself, who is this person in the mirror? Is this even the person I remember a year ago or five years ago? You've lost yourself in your relationship. And how can your relationship change if you've lost yourself? Okay, so we're going to ingredient number three now. And the third ingredient to save a dying relationship is motivation. And motivation is big. Motivation is what takes you from possibly where you are now to where you want to go. I want you to ask yourself, how motivated are you and your loved one as well to resolve the problems in your relationship? What's your motivation? The path to change will be revealed when you are ready to take the first step. I'm going to ask you, are you ready to take the first step? Because if you're not ready to do that, the change that you're hoping for will never happen. So hopeful versus hope, hope, hopeless, right? That's a big difference. Um, there's times where you're not going to feel very hopeful in your relationship, but what are you going to do, right, to begin to create that shift? How you feel and think about your relationship in the present will influence your motivation to create change, right? So if if you're looking at where things are now, and because of where things are now, you're not feeling very, very hopeful. That's going to affect your motivation to create change. Because in your mind, you're thinking, things just aren't going to get any better. Right? A lot of times when I hear that one person has dragged the other person into couples counseling or marriage counseling, the first thing I think is, how motivated is a person who's been dragged into doing something? Right? So is the person just showing up just to show their face and say, I gave it a try? Or is the person really there for the right reasons? Um, there's no, there's no ability to, on, on my end, to create change for somebody who's been dragged into anything. And I, I don't even try to do that. Because at the end of the day, the person has to really want to change and have that motivation to create that change. Even if you don't know how to get from where you are to where you want to go, if you're motivated to try to figure it out, that's one of the recipes to begin to become more hopeful and begin to create change. If you're hopeless, Right, in the case of somebody being dragged into counseling, if you're hopeless, how do you begin to create change? In a relationship, you're just doing it just to show your faith. So you're not completely invested. Yeah, and without that investment, the motivation won't be there. Right. Or or an honesty, Jeff. Isn't honesty about how you feel about the relationship like super important? If you go in there doing it for your other, for your partner to show face. And that creates a more hopeful feeling in your partner. 
it's honesty in, in that, in, in the situation where they're in your office, that honesty is really important because I actually went through this and, um, I don't believe that the, uh, the motivation was honest and with integrity on, on fixing it from, from my partner's perspective. So I think that, that just, and maybe he wasn't even being honest with himself, who knows, but that's a really, I think, important part is that we've got to both know where we stand when we're in your office to be able to move forward with honesty. Yes, yes, that's, that's very honest. And that's, that's key. That's really key. And, um, you know, a lot of times, um, it's about, it really starts with really starting with being honest with yourself, right? So are you being honest with yourself about where you are um, and admitting it to yourself? Because if you're not, if you're not being clear on that level, it can be hard to be clear on a relationship level. Um, and, you know, it's tough, you know, for a person to hear from the person that they care about and they love, hey, I'm, I'm not feeling it, you know, I'm not feeling connected. I, I'm not sure if I want to be here, um, you know, and, and that's important to know because if, the person telling you, hey, I'm not sure if I want to be here, the next question is, well, you know, what's your motivation then, right, to begin to work on things if you're not sure you want to be here? Um, and you can't create motivation in, in, in someone else unless they're willing and open to be receptive to it, right? So as a coach, you know, the person who's, who's coaching a team, I mean, he can be the best coach, but if the team is not into the message, right, and not really motivated, then the coach, no matter how good he or she is, is not going to make a difference. So this context is about creating change when you when you work with somebody who's an expert in the area of couples. But but no, if the therapist is, is going to try to motivate you to create change, to me, the, the, the therapist is in the wrong place because the motivation has to come from the, the couple, right? It has to come from you. If the therapist is the one that's creating the motivation, then you better bring the therapist home with you and make sure they sleep in the room next to you. Because at two in the morning, you may need him or her to come into your room to help create motivation again. That's expensive so couples you, you counseling. Want, want <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and hopefully the therapist doesn't have any other things going on in their life, right? <laughs> yeah, so, they they can't have a, you know, a, a private life, right? <laughs> no, like, what about Bob? So I think it was, what about Bob? I think that was that movie. So um, yeah, so you don't want that, and you don't want to rely on a therapist to create motivation. You're not really people go to therapy for years and years. Often, I um, I've, I've noticed. Um, they, the motivation that creates change comes from the therapist, which I think is in the wrong place. It needs to come from within the person, and, and then eventually you fire the therapist. You won't, you won't need the therapist any longer because you'll be so good at knowing how to create change between you and your loved one that you'll have the skills necessary um, rather than having the therapist to be the one to facilitate the change. So one of the questions to ask yourself, and, and I'm sure some of you who are here today are kind of asking yourself this, is are you really ready for the change? Right? And if you're not ready for the change, then don't fool yourself, right? Um, you know, Vicky was saying before about a, a big passion of mine is saving relationships. But I, I can tell you that um, I won't try to save a relationship if they don't want to be saved. So, you know, you have to want to be in the relationship. Um, you have to want to create the change. You have to really want to be there and be motivated and invested in trying to find solutions. Um, being talked into it is never a good idea. And I've often fired clients um, during the first meeting. At the end of the first meeting, they want to know why I won't work with them anymore. And often it's because I don't see that they're both really invested and motivated to create change. And, and that's really the only way to begin to move to a better place is really is being willing to be invested in your relationship and really have the motivation to begin to make things different. Without those two factors, then nothing will begin to change in your relationship. And, and love in and of itself is not enough. Um, Sometimes there's the illusion if you have love that that'll be enough to save the relationship. Um, love will keep things afloat for a little while, but inevitably, if the behavior doesn't change, if the investment doesn't get deeper and stronger, the connection doesn't begin to get altered, then nothing will begin to become different in your relationship. So the first can often be the most difficult, and I want you to ask yourself: Are you willing to move past? what's keeping you stuck to see the possibilities that life may offer. The first step is the most difficult because why? You're not sure if what you're going to do is actually going to make things different. And there's no promises, right? Um, when you put yourself in there and you're playing out all out and you're being vulnerable, 
there's no assurances that what you're doing is going to equate to the change that you're looking to find. It may not happen the way you want it to. But are you willing, right? Are you willing to take that first step? And and life is like that, right? Whether it's on an individual level, or relationship level, or in business, is the people who find the most success are willing to take the first step to creating that change and being vulnerable. They're willing to see what life has to offer. And that is a risk that you have to decide if you want to take. That's a personal choice. So one of the best ways of fixing your relationship is to first start with fixing yourself. Right? So the first session when I meet with couples, they do a great job of sharing with me how the other person needs to change. They have it down to perfect. I, a long list of, you know, my husband, my wife needs to do these things differently, and if they do this differently, everything will be fine. But how many times have you tried to fix your partner and came up completely unsuccessful with that approach? So it really starts with fixing yourself. When you, when you fix yourself and work on yourself, the relationship will change, or you'll move on to a new relationship. Right? Those are, those are two, two possibilities. So ask yourself, what's more painful, right? Ignoring the problems in your relationship or addressing the problems, right? Sometimes addressing it can feel more painful because you're bringing up stuff that is just so uncomfortable. Ignoring it can give you the illusion that everything is not so bad, so you don't feel the pain as much. That's how you begin to get numb, is you begin to ignore the problem. But we all know at the uh, in any relationship that's going to shift, that you would need to, on a very deep level, address the problems that are keeping you stuck. Because if you don't, you get more distance, as many of you have experienced, more distance, more disconnection, and at some point you stop liking this person that you used to love. So ask yourself, are you willing to play all out? Right? That's how you begin to create change in your relationship, being willing to play all out. You're completely in. Every fiber, the fabric of who you are. Now you, you may have doubt, can things be different or can things change, but are you willing to play all out and give it a role, right? Give it a chance. It's like that person who plays all the chips in at the casino, right? Are you willing to play all in? If you're, if you're fully invested in the change, the possibilities are endless. I've seen couples who their relationship, I would say, is in critical condition. They're on life support, but they wanted to breathe so badly, they want to breathe life into their marriage so badly, they're going to do whatever is necessary in order to turn the corner. They're playing all out. They want to figure it out. Do you want to figure it out? Does your loved one want to figure it out? If you want to figure it out, that's one of the first steps to begin to create change and save a, a relationship that's beginning to fade away. How can you create a happy marriage if you don't know what truly makes your spouse happy? If you don't know, then ask. A lot of times when you try to be mind readers in our relationship, ask your loved one what makes the other person happy. What, what do you need in order to be happy in this marriage? Ask yourself, have you ever asked yourself, you know, as you're sitting here today, have you ever approached a person you're with and asked that question? That's critically important. The other thing is, in order to create change, you have to dedicate yourself to making things better. It's really a dedication. Um, like anything else you've ever invested yourself in that really was worthwhile is you had to dedicate yourself to making things move from where they were to where you wanted things to go. You also have to have desire, right? A desire for a deeper connection with your partner and also being ready and willing and able to make the changes. So as you're sitting here today, I want you to ask yourself, and maybe it's something you need to think about a little bit, is are you ready to, to ignite the fire, the passion, and begin to experience a deep connection again? Ask yourself, are you ready to do that? Because that's what it takes. Are you ready to do that on a very deep level? I want you to think back to the greatest of times that you've had in your relationship, right? The smiles, the laughter, the connection. Remember the times where you could just read each other's mind, it was just so easy, right? And then things started to change. So many times I have couples ask me, can you really capture that? Can you, can you really ever get back to that exact place? Well, most likely you're not going to get back to the place you were 
the first three months you were dating, right? But yeah, you can recapture the love and that connection on a very deep level. It's just a more mature love because you've been through some things together. When you first get to know each other, you don't have any of that baggage, right? And ask yourself, are you tired of being frustrated with your relationship? And are you ready to start to be happy? Ask yourself that. So um, what I um, what I was sharing with Vicky is that I think I think she's going to probably put up on the site, but here's also so you have it. I'm giving everyone who's on the webinar a free a free ebook, and it's called the Five Critical Signs that Your Relationship Is on Life Support. So there should be a link. Um, I think that Vic will be putting up. If not, you can write into the email um, above at info at relationshipsunscripted.com. Um, it will give you a five, the five critical life support. It's an ebook, um, which really kind of goes into some of the things that would be telling you that your relationship is on life support, but it also gives you great solutions to begin to bring your relationship back to life once again. And the other thing I'm doing for everyone on, on the webinar today is um, you can call our 1 844 number, more love, um, if you'd like a complimentary consultation. That's for everybody that is on the webinar as part of Cafe D. And that's my gift to Vicki. Oh, Jeff, you're amazing. This was I, I, truly, and it's so funny because I'm, as you well know, I am past the divorce phase. And this was something that, I mean, I've been divorced now for, for several years. And I'm looking at this today. I, I've not taken this, but truly, I have not taken this many notes on a webinar that I've done so far to date. This was amazingly important because you know what you gave us? You gave us a recipe for success for future relationships. And you gave us um, hope that we can do this and we can do it differently. Just, just knowing that the best way to fix your relationship first is to start with fixing yourself. That when we go into a new relationship as, as fixed as we can possibly be, that I mean, that in itself, just doing the things and watching webinars just like this one is part of that, of, of that process. If we go into a relationship being happy and whole ourselves, we can be better partners to somebody that we're either in a relationship with currently or we're, we're going to even think about being in a relationship with. So this was like such amazing, amazing um, information. So, and also, you know, Ignoring the problems in your relationship, you said something to me that was so, you know, hit me again, you know, in, in the, the head, which was ignoring the problems in your relationship gives, ju it's just an illusion that they don't exist. They still exist. But by ignoring them, you know, you know, we just kind of let life go on. We compartmentalize. And that's the stuff that kind of brews underneath the surface, right? That's the stuff that comes bubbling up eventually. And finally, when you've left the toothpaste cap off the toothpaste, you go, what? And it becomes, like you said, what the, the little things become the big things because you've allowed all that stuff to be brewing underneath the, the, the surface. And when it comes out, it comes out as big, ugly, boiling hot lava, right? Exactly. You know. Um, it's it's just it's just a pleasure to be a part of what you're creating here, Vicky. And um, I know you know in our webinar, it's, it's really a challenge and it's really difficult to really address the depth of things. Um, but for me, my hope is that you know the, the each of you who are on the webinar really um, are using this opportunity to really begin to ask yourself some very important and very deep questions. And sometimes we need to let those kind of questions sit around for a little bit before we begin to ask ourselves what we need to do next with that information. Um, and every situation is different. Every couple is different. Um, I see couples that come in with the same kind of challenges, but the way we go about addressing might be completely different. So each couple is unique in their own way. And, and ask yourself where you are and, and then begin to have these conversations with you and your loved one. That, that would be my, my suggestion. Awesome. Well, I'm going to put this up. We're going to be putting this up on our website um, with all of the information on how you can get in touch with Jeff. Jeff is not only um, somebody that I respect and admire as a friend, he is an amazing counselor and therapist and has done so much in the work of keeping people together 
or helping them make that determination that this is not salvageable. And that's what I love about you. Your mission, when we talked about this at the beginning, you were like, I don't want people, you know, my, my job is not divorce. My job is, is relationships. So the fact that you've put this together and, and you're speaking to people that have been through it or are thinking about it just shows your commitment to relationships and connections and strong, loving, fire, passion-filled relationships. And for that, I'm so grateful that you've been on with us today. I am looking forward to hearing some feedback from everybody on this. If, if you're there, please let us know how you felt about this, because I know that I learned so much today. And Jeff, thank you so much for doing this for us. And, and again, we will let everybody know how to get in touch with you. So thank you, Jeff. And on that note, I want to wish everyone a beautiful day. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure. Bye-bye now.